Lecture on Great, thanks. Uh, okay, thanks all for coming back. Uh, so last time I sort of gave the definitions, I uh, went through sort of a, a little bit of just generally how you compute homology uh, of a group with arbitrary coefficients. And so today I just want to do some computations and examples. Okay, so, um, so just like, let me remind you of the setup and, and where we got to at the end of last time. So the setup is, um, I have some space X, which is a classifying space for some group. Um, say specifically X has finitely many cells, finitely many cells in all dimensions. Dimensions, and I'm looking at a certain chain complex, and that chain complex is I look at the L2 chains of X tilde. So right, this is where I got to at the end of last time. I want you to think about this as the sum of apologies to Danny, but complex numbers um, over uh, cells in X tilde. Uh, so formal sums of, of cells with complex coefficients and the sum of the norm squares is less than infinity, okay? And I said that this forms a chain complex, you just, um, Right, you know how to take the boundary of a single cell. So just take that and then extend uh, linearly over these over sums. Right. Um, so maybe just plus boundary n2, which goes from Cn to x tilde to Cn minus one. Okay. And uh, so, and just to say this, extend uh, the nth boundary from the usual chain group. Okay, there's sort of an obvious way to extend this. Just do that. Do the obvious thing. Always do the obvious thing. Um, okay, so uh, so this is my setup. So now I want to compute some examples. Right, last time I didn't really give you many examples. Um, so uh, thinking about Perhaps, perhaps I'm a Brighton student, so I'd like to think about Brighton's universe of finite of, of finitely presented groups. And this starts with sort of a point, which is the finite group. So my zeroth example is going to be finite groups. Right? So what's happening for a finite group? Right, well, it turns out that finite groups do have classifying spaces with finitely many cells in all dimensions. They're always going to be infinite dimensional. This is a little bit of an annoyance. But um, it's sort of a short exercise. It's an e I'll, I'll make it an exercise even. I'll tell Sam that it's an exercise, that you should prove that uh, the finite groups have classifying spaces with finitely many cells in all dimensions. Um, okay, and the point there is that, so if uh, X, so finite group, G. So if X has finitely many cells, finitely many cells in all dimensions, uh, right, then when you take its universal cover, right, the number of cells just goes up multiplicatively with the order of the group, right? For each cell downstairs, you get one G orbit of cells upstairs. If G is finite, those orbits are going to be finite. So you're getting a finite sum of finite things. Um, so X tilde also has, right? Everyone happy with that? No, no complaints there. Okay, so now I, I go back to looking at this and I realized that, well, now, this sum is a finite sum. So this part here, vacuous, right? Always true for finite sums. Um, so in this case, in this case, C 2n of x tilde is the same as, so I guess I'll say it like this. It's the same as you take, uh, you just take the regular chain group, right? The, the simplicial or cellular chain group uh, with, with complex coefficients, right? So it's topic to C to the N. Well, sorry. so let me just say it like this. Okay. So then this boundary map, well, I don't really have to extend this particularly much. I just have to extend this, right? The, these are free abelian groups, right? So when I say, oh, there should be a minus one here. These, these are free abelian groups. So when I say extend linearly, I mean, just extend over the complex coefficients in the obvious way. Um, 
So, and boundary n is our boundary n2 is the regular chain map, it's the regular boundary. So, so when I compute this homology, I'm not actually getting anything interesting. What I'm actually doing is, right, these groups are just the chain groups with coefficients in C, the boundary map is just the regular boundary map. So uh, in this case, the L2 cohomology of uh, G, which I guess, I'm not sure I used this notation last time, but maybe this is the L2 cohomology of X tilde, is in fact just the regular homology of X tilde with complex coefficients. Right? Yeah. Uh, um, right, this just goes back to last time in that, um, right, my genuine setup was that I'm using X tilde to get some, I mean, secretly there's something going on in the background where I'm, I want to say like free resolution and then I'm tensoring with L2 of G. So the point is that um, these chain groups have a G action, right? And so that's giving, um, the point is that this chain group has a G action and, and that G action, um, right? I really want this to be some, some invariant of G. Whereas if I work downstairs, I mean, if I work downstairs, then all of my spaces, uh, if I worked downstairs, right? So if I move this tilde, remove tildes everywhere, then this equality would always be true. And I'd just be computing the regular complex, the, the homology of my space with complex coefficients. So somehow to get some more interesting invariant, I want to pass to this, to, to upstairs and then this slightly other space, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, so the punchline is exactly what Riley says, um, right? X is a classifying space. So what did that mean? That means the fundamental group is G and the universal cover is contractible. This is a contractible space. Hopefully you know how to compute the homology of a contractible space. It's the same as the homology of a point. So this is uh, C if N equals zero and zero otherwise. Okay. So for finite groups, perhaps we're, um, we're not maybe getting anything interesting. I mean, actually, this is also equal to the, um, so for finite groups, it's a little exercise, but you could even check that this is, um, so this is the same as the, this is actually the same as the homology of the downstairs space with complex coefficients. Okay, but so for finite groups, actually nothing, nothing really interesting is happening, right? You get the same answer regardless of your finite group. Um, really, you're just seeing that this space is contractible. Okay, so, uh, so that's fine. Maybe from like last talk, there were lots of people who say I, I didn't, there were lots of people who are saying things like I don't care about finite subgroups or finite groups. So, like, so maybe you should not be unhappy with this result. Right? Um, okay, so, uh, so, so let's move to the first infinite group, uh, right? And uh, the first infinite group should be the integers, right? Surely, maybe not. Somebody can argue with me later about this. Um, and let's compute the, the L2 homology of the integers. Okay, so firstly, I told you what a classifying space for this thing is last time, right? So, uh, so G is gonna be the integers, X is gonna be the circle and X tilde, oh, and I guess, uh, right? I'm doing everything cellularly. So maybe like, let me be very precise. This is the circle I'm thinking about. It has one vertex and one edge. The universal cover is um, X tilde is R uh, vertices. So you put the vertices at the integers, you put an edge between adjacent integers. Okay, um, okay so, uh, so let's look at our, um, so let me, let me do this pictorially. Sure. Put algebra aside. Uh, Maybe this sort of will answer Dave's question from the end of last time of me trying to get me to draw more examples. Um, okay, so I have this, uh, I have this real line and right, and I want to, so let's begin by looking at, um, let's look at, uh, well, sorry, let me say this. I have, so my, my chain groups are, or well, my chain complex is I have zero mapping to C12 of R, mapping to uh, 
C zero two of R mapping to zero. Okay, um, right, and I want to think about this, this, this chain group here is really nothing than L2 of Z and same here, right? So there's one orbit, um, there's one orbit of vertices, right? So you're getting ex an exact correspondence between uh, assigning complex numbers to vertices and assigning complex numbers to integers, right? You, I mean, with this setup, it's even more obvious what that isomorphism is. There's also one orbit of edges. So assigning complex numbers to edges, if I pick one to be the one corresponding to the identity, then uh, I get this isomorphism here. Okay, so, uh, so this is my setup and I want to look at, uh, let's start, let's just start by looking at H2, the, the first, L2 homology of Z. Okay, so what's happening here? What is this? So to understand this, I have to understand what this chain map looks like. So here I have boundary one, two. Um, and there's no incoming image. So this is just the kernel of boundary one, two. And my claim is that this is, uh, so my claim is that this is trivial. Right, so how do I see this? Let's look at some, um, let's look at some cycle. Like, so take some non-trivial cycle. Uh, sorry, take some non-trivial chain, right? So being non-trivial just means that at least one edge, the, the complex value on at least one edge is non-trivial. Okay, so you look at your edge where it's non-trivial and then divide through by the complex number on that edge and then use the Z action. I mean, you may as well, if I label these vertices, Zero, one, two, minus one, minus two, minus three. I may as well assume that my non-trivial uh, chain has a one on this edge, right? Like just move things around by the G action. I mean, suppose I had an I on this edge. Well, then translate my I back to this edge using the Z action and divide through my whole chain by I to force this one to be one. Right, and these maps. The point is that this map is equivariant with respect to the z actions on both sides, right? And it's also linear with respect to c. So if, if I had something that was in the kernel, then that that action would preserve being in the kernel. Okay, so I put a one on this edge, right? So now when I take the boundary of this, uh, so maybe on the top I'll draw my chain c. And on the bottom, I'll draw the boundary of C, right? So what's happening when I take the boundary of this? Well, you know how to take the boundary. It's just, you're just doing cellular homology. You're just, I mean, it's even simplicial homology, right? You just end up with um, a one at this vertex and a minus one at this vertex, right? Technically, I, I guess I want to, I'm going to orient all my edges to the right. That's the contribution from that edge. That, right. That's the contribution from this edge. Yeah, yeah, sorry. That's the contribution from this edge. Sorry, yeah, yeah, exactly. So then if I want this to be in the, um, if I want this to be in the kernel, then what I need is this boundary to be zero. Okay, so I have a one at this vertex, right? So I need to add something to this edge to make that zero. What am I gonna do? Well, what's the only thing I can do? I'm gonna put a one here, All right? So that's good, that's nice. I've like pushed my problem, you know, so what we all want to do, just push your problem down the road and hopefully like far enough down the road, you, you just stop worrying. But that doesn't happen in this case. You then say, oh, okay, well then I'm going to have to put a one here. Great, this is zero. I get one here. I put a one on this edge. And so now uh, I have zeros here, 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 and a minus one here. So it looks good on this chunk, but quite clearly this process is never going to end. And so, uh, Right, the only way I'm gonna get, if I have a one on any edge or something non-trivial on any edge, then I'm gonna to have to have that same non-trivial thing on all edges, right? But now my chain is like a sum of, right? So what are my, what are my complex numbers here? They're just ones, right? They definitely don't satisfy this, right? I, right? Hopefully everyone agrees that a sum of ones doesn't converge. So if I were a manifold, would this work like the top and then 
Let's see, Riley's ruining, you, you're ruining all my punchlines. No, 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 that's fine. No, 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 that's good. It, it, so, okay, so actually, so what have we shown? So in fact, in fact, if, uh, if X is a manifold, um, then, so here I want to say, uh, let's say K manifold, then H, K2 of X tilde equals zero. Right, what was I really using in this proof? I was really using that each vertex is in exactly two one cells, right? And so when I had something non-trivial on a one cell, I had to cancel it at the vertex. Right? If you do this in a manifold, what's the property of a manifold? Every K minus one cell is in exactly two K cells. So if I put something non-trivial on a K cell, I might have to cancel that in the neighboring K cell, I'd have to cancel that. You get exactly this picture, it propagates out. Okay, um, everyone happy if this thing's zero? Yeah. I'm confused because, like, when you turn that into this this main complex here, it yeah. feels like you're just forgetting the group X. Um, but is it really is that it's hidden in the so the boundary map? Um. Um. So actually, actually, so the answer to your question is no. Really, really, I've forgotten the group action, and the point is that. So there are going to be some points where I'm going to say, I'm going to get back to something later, which is going to recover the group action. But the thing is that if you have a group that acts co-compactly on, on two spaces, then, um, yeah, sorry. If, if you have two groups that act, that have classifying spaces with the same universal cover, then as abelian groups, their L2 homologies are the same as abelian groups, right? So, so, that, so in some sense, this has forgotten the G action, right? Um, We'll, we'll come back to where the G action is coming into the picture a little bit towards the end. Um, and so maybe then you'll be a little bit happier, but, but for now, yeah, you can, you can think that we've forgotten the G action. Um, okay. Uh, right, so if, if, I have a, if I have a K manifold, so any other, oh, yeah, any other questions about this? Everyone's sort of happy with this? Yeah, that's true whether is Um. Yeah, yeah, this is true if X tilde is some infinite thing, right? As I say, it's just that the, the proof that was used here was basically every vertex is in exactly two one cells. And, and if you want to make this proof, so actually I, I wrote this. So this one I've already emailed to Sam. Um, exercise, check the details of this, but it really is just that every K minus one cell is in exactly two K cells. So somehow you'd have canceling is very precise. Yeah. So this is yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's that's a fair, fair shout. Aspherical, right? Actually, you could define this for non aspherical I mean, right? This definition, this definition doesn't use aspherical anywhere, and so the same proof works for for non aspherical But then maybe you're not getting a group invariant, and maybe we're all group theorists in this room. I mean, that wasn't one of the options I gave you yesterday, but the, that's an option that you're allowed. You're, I mean. There are other options than the three I suggested. Um, somebody's already told me that they would say they're a combinatorist. So, um, okay, yeah. Okay, so, uh, wait, so here's H H1. So uh, H1 for this group vanishes. So now um, this tells you that maybe there's one, um, right? Obviously the things higher than two, two or higher are all gonna vanish. There's just no chains. Minus one and lower are all going to vanish. It's just no chains. Um, so let's look at uh, H zero set. Right. So here's where. Um, okay. So here's a point where. Uh, okay. So here's a point where things are going to get a little bit hazy. So I'm going to give you an idea, and I'm not going to fill in all the details. And I think that the details are not enlightening and tricky. And the correct way to do this is to use analysis, but I've already told a lot of you that I'm terrible at analysis. So, um, so those proofs scare me. Um, okay, so the answer is, so I'll tell you what the answer is. The answer is, um, is zero, right? So let's look at this picture again. So what's the, I'm gonna erase this and I'm just gonna leave up my picture of R. Erase this and this. So what's the, um, so the kernel of the uh, zeroth boundary map 
well, I erased it too early. Um, right, the zeroth boundary map was mapping from uh, zero chains to zero, so this is everything. Right, so we have to show. So to show this is zero, uh, so we need to show so that the closure of the image, this thing, t t one two, is equal to c zero. Right. So I said these homology groups are kernel modulo closure of the image. Right. And so I have to show that this closure is everything. So now I start looking at, uh, right? So let's take some, uh, let's take some candidate one chain. Okay, so you, so firstly, like think about, think about for a second what the actual image of D1 is, right? What's the image of the first boundary map? Well, you can check that, right? Because the boundary of a one cell is you put the value, um, you take the value on the one cell and you put X at this point and minus X at this point, that if I do that over all one cells, then the sum of what I get is gonna to add to zero. So the image, note, the image of boundary one of two is equal to those set of zero chains such that the sum of these things is actually equal to zero. So there are definitely things not in the, not in the image, right? So let's look at one. So let's look at, uh, this one. I just put a one at this point and I put zeros everywhere else. Right? This is a perfectly good L2 chain. Right? This is a perfectly good chain. And in fact, if you were studying regular, uh, if you're just studying homology with say complex coefficients or integer coefficients, uh, this chain would be a non-trivial element of H0. But my claim here is that this is actually a, a trivial element of L2. Okay, so what I wanna do is so what would be your first guess of what you do? Well, I want this to be a boundary. So perhaps I could start by putting a one on this edge. The boundary of that is going to be one here and minus one here. And I could put a one on this edge. So then it's going to be one, zero, minus one. And I can repeat. This is very bad. Same reasoning as before. If I want to do this and cancel this out to infinity, right, I'm going to get a sum of constant things. Right. So what I want to do instead is I want to sort of approximate this chain. So I spent the last few days trying to come up with how to do this without saying Fourier transform. Um, and, and I came up with an answer and then the answer was wrong. So then I spent another 24 hours and I came up with a new answer. This answer is correct, but, uh, but I think it's not enlightening. So I, I, I'll tell you what it is, but, but I, don't, I don't think it's interesting. So you take these chains. And so what I do is I put, uh, on this edge, I put one minus some relatively, uh, so I put something which is pretty close to, uh, that looks pretty close to zero. I'm now very nervous about, what? Ah, okay. Mm. Okay, so uh, so I'm going to get Sam to I'm going to find my other page of notes and get Sam to write down what I wrote down in the problem session and apologize for now. So um, you basically want to put some chain of things which n right. You want to put some chain of things such that as n goes to infinity, all of these things are going to uh, sort of tend towards the constant chain, which is one 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 one. Um, Right, which means I think that my error is that these pluses should be minuses, right? So this thing tends towards zero, right? So I'm gonna get one minus it. So this, the, the number on this edge is gonna to tend towards one. Okay, and I wanna do that in a way that L2, the boundary L2 approximates this chain. Okay, as I say, this is not enlightening and I apologize for showing you this. Are you avoiding putting the same attack in the boundary edge? Uh, so I'm sort of having this one over 10, start at one over 10 and then become one over 10 squared. So it gets, draw a graph, draw a graph. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, this is Sam's suggestion yesterday, which is much better. Yeah, so I want to like, I want to like, I, I sort of want to take, so 
Okay, so what's the function I want? The function I want is a function that looks like this. This is very bad. So instead of thinking about square sum sequences, maybe think about square integrable functions, right? So I maybe want to approximate this with square integrable functions. Maybe I even want to do it continuously. So what I could do is, is start taking things that decay off this way, right? And they decay um, a little bit less each time, right? And so then I can approximate, I can approximate this function where clearly this part's very bad with functions of the square integral. Okay, so there's some analysis in the background there. And... So, it's, but it, yeah, so the point is that it's important you mod by the closure, right? So if you don't mod by the closure, then you don't get everything. Um, when I say closure, I mean, um, yeah, sorry, what do I mean when I say closure? When I say closure, I mean, this has um, an inner product, this space has the L2 inner product, and I mean, uh, that gives you a metric and you take the closure with respect to that metric. You yeah. know that the inner is affecting the one where the output is zero. Yeah. Around the first 2n vertices, and the back minus 1 over 2n, and then. So I think this is what I first tried, and then there's some issue that it maybe didn't quite approximate in the, that the boundary didn't approximate the thing I wanted it to in the correct way. So, 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 okay. Well, um, sorry, there was a question here. Did, did you have something? Just a simple question, which, yeah. which is the change you want to approximate? Which is the... So I want to approximate this. I want, I want the, this, this is some, this is some one chain, right? So CN belongs to C12 of R. And I want the, my claim is that the boundary of CN tends towards this chain on the top. The one with, with one, one. Yeah, the one with one, one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. The, the, yeah, yeah. It's a bad, it's a bad idea to do the integers in, in too many ways. Anyway, we, okay, so what I want to say is, I want to say that this thing is zero. Um, it's possible to prove it's zero, right? You can sit down and do it. It's, it's just a bit nasty and you, you can say some, so approximating things. And, and so there are two things here. So one, it's important to take the closure. And the second thing is a discussion I want to postpone for five minutes, um, which is like, why did I spend three days doing this? Well, okay, great question. But actually like, why would you try and do this, right? So secretly, I, I must have known something, right? Like I wasn't, well, I, I'd, read, I, I'd read a textbook which told me the answer. But I mean, secretly, I knew that this chain was going to be in the closure. So I knew that such a sequence could exist. And then I just had to sit down and find one, what, right? What does that image look like? Sorry? What does that image look like? The image of, the, the, this image, this, this image. Of, Oh, just put, just take, I mean, like here you get one minus this thing, which is going to tend towards one as n tends towards infinity. And then here you get this minus this, or sorry, this minus this, which tends towards zero as n tends towards infinity. I mean, it's it, like, when I'm, okay, sorry, I shouldn't have drawn this picture. No, it's great. <laughs> I, so so this, this picture, oh, and then you, oh, and you should also put zero on all of these things. Um, I, I didn't intend for this picture to be enlightening. I didn't really intend for you. I didn't really intend for you to see it and be like, oh yeah, I know I, I mean, everything that's going on. But, but, but I think it explains, if you, if you believe that these sequences converge in the way that I said, it, it explains it. And I think maybe this function picture also. Is. Maybe if, you, if you'll give me like 10 minutes, we'll get to, I'll get to a point where I can tell you why I knew what the answer was gonna be. Um, but what I do wanna say about this picture, so if you believe this picture, right? What have I done? Well. Oh, uh, sorry, so, yeah, yeah, so, so I have this picture. This picture tells me that this one particular uh, chain is in the closure of the image, or this one particular cycle, right? So how do I get any other cycle? Well, um, just move it around. So let me write it here. Move this around by, uh, by the, uh, CG, actually, right? So I have this, so what I'm saying is here I've written down some chains where the boundaries approximate this one particular zero cycle. But if I wanted to approximate a different one, like if I put a one at this point and zeros everywhere else, well, there's a very obvious way to do that. If I put like a one here and an I here, then you sort of do this for this one and you do I times it for this one. Okay, and so then what I'm saying is you can get chains with finite support by the group action but chains with 
Chains with finite support are dense in, um, in square summable chains, right? Okay. In fact, square summable chains are some sort of completion of the finitely supported chains. So once you get all of the finitely supported chains, you get everything. Okay. So um, there's, there's quite a lot of detail on sweeping the, a very large rug, but, but so that's the point. Okay. So, so look at this one. And so what have you, what have we really shown here? What we sort of done is we've taken a chain, we've taken this cycle, which is one at one point, And basically, if you forget that you're in Z, what this picture is saying is, if I have a point and I can find some infinite length path out of that point, then I can make this argument work. Right? So if I have an infinite group, then an infinite group always has an infinite length path. And so this shows the algebra if g is zero if g is infinite right play this same game right play this exact same game right take some um take some chain with support on one element find some infinite path containing that element you can push this up to infinity right so the zero right so now you know the zero l2 homology for all groups it's pretty that's something um, okay, so, uh, so if it's infinite, this is true. Okay. I have a quarter of a plane. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see this in the lecture three when I just talk about applications and things that I think are cool. I think that like, you'll basically see something that, that does that, but I think that, yeah, you can, um, yeah, broadly speaking, if you, yeah, it's, I think it's not, I, I'm nervous that it's not quite true in the way that it, you've stated. I think I have to be a little bit careful about how I like, but, but, but something like that, you could try and, you could try and make work. Oh, that is an exercise I emailed to Sam. Uh, uh, okay, so, so this is how you compute zero homology and, um, right, and so the thing was that maybe I knew this fact, right? And so I knew that this was gonna be true, so I sat down and thought, well, maybe I can find some sequence which makes this very obvious. I didn't succeed. Such is life. Um, okay, so zero L two homology is always uh, is always complex. It is the complex numbers if you're finite and it's zero otherwise. Um, so far, we haven't seen an interesting example of something with non-vanishing first uh, L two homology. Right. So for finite groups, it's always trivial. Um, for Z, it, it happened to be trivial. I wrote this at the top here. Um, so that's what I want to give you now. And actually, so what's the next group you would think of? Right? This is another like start of a Brightson talk, I think. Um, right? Don't take a product, uh, take a wedge, right? So, um, so uh, example two, I guess, uh, free groups. Okay, so all free groups, um, so all free groups have a classifying space, which is just a three valent graph. So, for whatever finite rank free group you want to think about, um, you can take uh, x, a free valent graph, and x tilde is nothing other than the three valent tree. So my claim is that it was Riley who suggested to me that we should all be thinking about the three valent tree and everyone always rules the four valent tree. So I decided I wanted to be slightly different. Okay. I would contemplate doing this until I'm told to stop, but. Um, okay, so here's my universal cover, and then sort of uh, it, this sort of relates to maybe um, to maybe George's question, right? I'm now just looking at this, and as I said, for the for the free group, you know, it doesn't really matter what rank it is. Maybe that's not so surprising, but somehow, like, I'm vaguely just forgetting the group action. So one, um, right? But you do happen to know that if if this is the universal cover of a classifying space for your group, then your group is free, right? Um, uh, yeah, e everyone should read Sir. Uh, everyone should read part two of Sir. Is that what I'm supposed to, that's the advice I'm supposed to give? Yeah, everyone should read part two of Sir. nobody does, but, but I haven't, and I didn't follow that, but okay. Anyway, uh, so here's this revenge tree, right? Once again, we have, um, we have the same setup where it's a graph. So I only have two chain groups. Um, 
just say T, T, C1, C02 of T, this thing maps to zero. Okay, uh, I know that the zero to L2 uh, homology is going to vanish, right? You can do the same trick. It's very easy now. If you say put a one at this point, you can find some infinite geodesic in your tree that goes on. And you can apply the same argument here. So what's happening for the, the first L2 homology? Well, once again, the same, the same thing here, it's just the kernel of the, um, this first boundary map. And uh, so claim which one, two of Fn. Okay, and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna draw an, uh, I'm just gonna draw an L2 chain and then we're gonna check, check that it's really an L2 chain and that it's a boundary. So let's orient all my edges so that my boundary map makes sense or I mean, I guess not makes sense, but you know how to, you know where the minus should go. Okay. So all edges are sort of oriented from left to right, right? And I'm gonna put a one on this edge and then on these four neighboring edges, I'm going to put uh, immediate panic. No, 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 immediate panic. Okay, let's, uh, you ever given a talk where your notes are just wrong? Um, yeah, that's good. That's good. And then I'm going to put a half here and a half here. That's good. Right. So, um, so what, what am I really doing? Right. I, when I take the boundary of this, when I take the boundary of just this edge in isolation, I get a one here and a one here. And so now when I take the boundary of these halves, I get a half here and a minus half here and a half here and a minus half here. So those minus a halves cancel the one that I got here. And these plus a halves cancel the one I got here. Right. So now I come back here and I say, uh, right, I'm going to have minus a half. So, so I've sort of fixed this. I fixed the things close to the center, right? And now I'm going to add in these quarters to fix the things further out, right? And I just do this over here. And um, one over eight. Okay. I'm going to repeat. Right. Here's, right. Okay. I can hear mutterings of, of the square. Right? It's the, it's not an L1 chain, right? Right. This is not an L1 chain, right? So, okay. So there are two things to check, right? The first thing that you have to check is that it, the first thing that you have to check is that it's an L2 chain, right? So what does it mean to be an L2 chain? It means square summable, square, okay? This chain is not summable, right? You can, you can see it's like one plus one plus one plus one, and you get a lot of ones over here. And once again, I hope you will believe that the, Sum of ones is not convergent. Um, okay, so, um, but if I square it, right? So what happens? Well, if I look at, sorry? Uh, you have to, yeah, yeah, it's one of the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I panicked it, because in my notes, I wrote a different thing. I just panicked. It's like I had that moment, but then I was like, it's fine. It's got to be fine. Um, yeah, so that, that's garbage. Um, so, okay, so let's write this down. So it's one plus four times one over two squared plus, uh, so there are eight of these edges. So let's say this is, so this should be two squared over two squared, two to the three over. So each of these has size, uh, two to the three over two to the four, right? Each of these is one over two squared, but you're squaring the weight on these edges, right? Plus, so the ones with an eighth, right? I think there are eight over here and there are going to be eight over here. So that's um, two to the four over, and what's the weight on them? It's one over two to the three. So I square it, so it's two to the six, two to the six, right? So now if I write this, uh, Another point where I wish my notes were better. Um, now, if I write this down, this is like the sum from n equals zero to infinity of two to the n over two to the n minus one times two. Yeah, something like that. Close, close enough, I think. Okay, is everyone sort of? Everyone's happy with this, right? Okay, I'm. 
I'm happy because I like complex numbers more. <laughs> <laughs> I just, just put just put either. Um, okay, so then uh, whatever, rearrange this. Uh, like the cancel cancel some ends. This is the sum of. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Less than infinity. Okay, so this is square summable, right? So I've, I have written down an L two chain. So now I just have to check it's a boundary, right? So what does it mean to be a boundary? Well, you just. I checked it. I think I checked it. Right. It's uh, sorry. I mean, it's a cycle. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I checked the boundary. So, right. I already said this. You just, it's a one here and I get two minus a halves. Here I get a half. I get two minus a quarters. Da, da, da. Um, so the, the uh, first L2 homology of the free group is non trivial. And um, what is it? Um, it's uh who do i want to look at who's going to tell me the answer to this i think so i think um i think it's a uh it's some giant it's some giant thing i mean it's it's like it's like l2 of this um like i can then move this whole thing around by c of g but then i get the closure of that so i think it's like l2 of this this space maybe maybe, maybe it's isomorphic to l2 of this space uh Okay, there was a nod and a thumbs up from the audience. So, um, okay, so, um, so great. Okay, so, so these are some computations. These are some things that you could do, right? And so then you could, um, you could look at more interesting places and try and run this same game. You could try and do things like try and um, run this where you have some quarter plane and maybe prove that some, um, some certain one cycles that aren't obviously vanishing vanish. Um, but, you know, I was preparing this mini course and I didn't just come up with these examples from nowhere and partially maybe I came up with these examples from a book, but how do you know? So one thing, I, one question that you should ask is like, how did I know um, or how would you know that I should expect, say, uh, how would you know that you should maybe expect this to be trivial and uh, this to be non-trivial? Like why? Um, like because if you if you know the if you know the answer and you want to find something that proves the answer, then that's definitely easier than just going in blindly. Okay, and so I didn't just go in blindly for these. So I want to just spend uh, six minutes telling you a little bit about what's going on. So, um, so what's actually going on? Um, or yeah. So here's the thing. So like here's maybe a question that you can ask and we'll be able to answer in, in two minutes, right? What's the is the first L2 homology of a surface non-trivial, right? So now you could try and do this thing. So let's say like the genus two surface, you could uh, start with the hyperbolic plane. Okay, it's a manifold. So, you know, the second one vanishes, you know, the zeroth one vanishes because it's infinite. Those are things I've told you. If I just told you to go away and figure out if the first one's non-trivial, well, now there's a boundary map that you have to worry about and there's like some complications. Um, so I want to tell you an easier way to, to get to that answer. And the easier way, uh, involves what are known as the L2 Betty numbers. So, um, so L2 Betty numbers. I'm not going to formally define these because to do that would require me to talk about linear operators and, and traces of linear operators, and I'm not the right person. Um, but, okay, so the point being that to, uh, for each n, n there is a notion um of um dimension of the nth l2 betty number of my group right and this is the um nth l2 betty number of g right this is the same as when you're doing um when you're doing some bushel homology, you can define the Betty numbers as just you, uh, right? All of, my, all of my complexes have finitely many cells in every dimension, or they have finitely many G orbits of cells in every dimension. So for, for compact complexes, you can define, um, oh, sorry, for, for complexes with finitely many cells in a certain dimension, you can define the Betty number 
as well, your homology group is a finitely generated abelian group, so you just define it to be the rank of the free abelian part. Alternatively, you could take homology with complex coefficients and define it to be the dimension of that complex vector space, or you could take it with real coefficients or rational coefficients, whatever you, whatever you want. So there's, there's a way to do this for L2. There's some nice notion of dimension, which I'm just going to just tell you that it exists, and I'm going to give you a way of computing it or a definition that you can take. You're like, um, but it has some nice properties. So, um, so without telling you what this thing is, let me tell you um, a, uh, a theorem. So it's not the dimension of a C. That's, yeah. So, so if I, so, so the natural thing you might try and do is you might try and say, well, these L2 things are, um, these L2 things are really modules for the complex group ring. So you might try and say it's like the dimension of, with, of, over the complex group ring, but that doesn't quite work. So then you have to define some, um, some more complicated um, ring of associated operators. And then you can take the dimension with respect to that. So the, like the, there's some, like to, to make all of this work, I really would have had to talk about Hilbert G modules. And as I say, that's not, I'm, I'm not the person who should give that mini course. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, theorem, which I think you should just take as some facts. So the first one is maybe the most important one for us. So the nth L2 Betty number of G is zero in the setup I've given, even only if the um, nth L2 homology group is zero. Okay, so if you're trying to prove that something's Trivial, perhaps you know something, and we'll we'll see this in a second. So perhaps I know this vanishes, so then I know this is trivial. So I know what I should aim at. Perhaps I know this isn't zero for some reason. I'll, you'll see an example in a second. So I know this doesn't vanish, so I know what I should aim at. Right. So that's one fact. The second fact is, uh, right, the uh, zeroth L two Betty number of G is one over the size of G. Right, so it turns out that so so now we're seeing some dependence on the group. Right, this dimension this dimension function has the group inside it. So this sort of relates to George's question, like the group is coming back into the into play. Right, and so while for finite groups, um, and I guess I should say conventionally one over infinity is zero. Right, so for finite groups, the dimension of of the complex numbers as a module in in whatever sense I want this to be has this dimension. Right. So while all of those things are isomorphic, they they have some extra there's some extra information being carried. Yeah. Oh, I have two minutes. I have two minutes. Okay. Sorry. Um, sorry. I had a conversation yesterday about finitely dominated complexes, and then I was like, Do I have to say that these things are finitely dominated? Please don't tell me that's true. Okay. Uh, anyway, so two minutes. Um, okay. So so this is the zeroth L two Betty number. So um, the nice thing is that L two Betty numbers do what you think they should when you pass to finite index subgroups. So if um, the index of H and G is finite, uh, then the uh, ith L2 Betty number, the, the nth L2 Betty number of H is that index uh, times the nth L2 Betty number of G, right? Which is better than regular Betty numbers. If you think about this, so think about for a free group, the rank of the first homology doesn't change in the obvious way. It doesn't just go up multiplicatively. Um, and the final thing is that if uh, X is a compact KG1, compact KG1, then um, what I can do is I can look at the alternating sum of these Betty numbers to I G, I equals zero to infinity. And this happens to be the same as the Euler characteristic of X, right? So now with these facts, um, you can actually, um, right? This tells you maybe, maybe now you can already prove some more things, right? So, but let's say, let's say the fundamental group of a, of a hyperbolic surface, I can now just look at the things I've told you today. So, uh, right? The, the first L2 Betty number is zero, that's an infinite group. The second L2 Betty number is zero by this fact about manifolds. 
And so what's the first L2 Betty number? Well, the first L2 Betty number I can now compute from this Euler characteristic, right? Because this is just some naive, I mean, this is like really very naively, this is just some count of cells in this compact space X, right? And so the first L2 Betty number is something like 2G, 2G minus two plus one, 2G minus one. So the 2G minus one or 2G minus three, write down the actual computation, you'll get it very quickly. Okay, so now suddenly you know that actually this, um, this thing is gonna be non-trivial for all hyperbolic surfaces, just from these relatively simple things. All right, so next time I'll, I'll say a little bit more about, just a, a tiny bit more about how these L2 Betty numbers, like I'll give you something you can take as a definition and then we'll just talk about applications. All right, thanks all for listening. Questions? What if I love finite dimensional numerical numbers, but I don't love reactions? You can get away with it. So the thing is that this, um, yeah. So that's a that's a great question. So if you prefer if you prefer proper actions, right? So so what's the point about taking a universal cover? Really, the point is that it's a space with a it's a contractible space with a free um, with a free proper co-compact G action, which is cellular. Um, you can throw away uh, free. So if you just have a proper cellular action and actually if you have an action where all your cell stabilizers are A2 acyclic, so they have vanishing L2 homology, then that will still compute. The, the whole thing will work, the game will flow. You can compute your L2 homology for that. So that there's, there's more general, yeah, you can have like, but pro proper actions, maybe for people here, the actions don't have to be free, they could just be proper. Okay, and then you can make this statement. I mean, then, then I can have compact classifying spaces for or co-compact classifying spaces for proper actions and do some more stuff. The Betty number is indistinguishable from the Yeah. Yeah. Do you like see that? Like somehow the Betty number can tell you like those yeah. independent elements. So sort of maybe what you're seeing in, in this picture is say it, it's some sort of perhaps volume type thing, right? Because because while they're all acting on the same space, the quotients are going to get larger and larger and larger. And so somehow like Maybe you should think of this first L2 Betty number as some some sort of notion of volume of the the question. Maybe like maybe draw like, like independent cycles or F2 two or three independent cycles. Oh, um, yeah. So um, the answer is no because I don't. Uh, yeah, the answer. Use a high use a high valence tree. Sure. And then and the cycle on the BC edges, but it yeah. So but then maybe I could collapse. But I, I think maybe it's not clear from this picture, right? Because the thing is that really what's happening here is, as I say, this for free groups, this group is going to be exactly the same as an abelian group, and it's really that you're thinking of it as a module over a different ring for each free group. So really, like this part of the dimension function is changing. So like, what I exactly mean by independent is a little bit hard to say in C pictorially.